Okay, thanks, Trevor. So uh, I am uh, Ocao's Chief Operating Officer and uh, also a uh, lawyer uh, by training and worked as a, uh, a representative of injured workers uh, from about 1990 until, uh, until I started at Ocao uh, almost six years ago. Um, so I'm gonna start off uh, for those from uh, outside Ontario with a brief, uh, brief overview of where uh, the Workplace Safety and Insurance Appeals Tribunal fits in our system and the general uh, legal approach here. So we have a Workplace Safety and Insurance Act uh, that technically covers all workers. Um, most are covered by the no-fault system uh, administered by the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board. Uh, but the rest, for the rest, the Act modifies the common law employer liability regime and, uh, and those workers have a right to sue. But if you are included uh, in the list of, if your employer is included in the list of covered employers for the no-fault benefit scheme, uh, that is your exclusive remedy. And the uh, Workplace Safety and Insurance Board both uh, sets uh, premiums uh, for most of the employers and then sends bills to the self-insured employers who are government uh, bodies and uh, monopolies uh, and also adjudicates claims from workers, uh, which in 2019 uh, was about 214,000 uh, claims. Uh, in every one of those cases, uh, the board's uh, task is to adjudicate the claim in accordance with the act and its own policies. Um, lots of people speak about settlements um, or uh, are looking for settlements and claims. Uh, that's just not a thing within our system. Uh, where a claim is denied or any part of a claim is denied. So it's broken up obviously into different issues about initial entitlement uh, for an, uh, for an accident and then for each uh, area of injury and then for the benefits flowing from that. Uh, so there's an internal appeal uh, within the WSIB uh, and an external appeal to the Workplace Safety and Insurance Appeals Tribunal, which is the subject of uh, my talk today. Uh, both the board and the tribunal are protected from judicial review uh, by the highest form of uh, protection that we have uh, in uh, in our administrative law, uh, which means that uh, the act just says they cannot be judicially reviewed. And then it's up to the lawyers to find some uh, uh, exceptions. I am only aware of uh, one instance in, the, in which the, uh, the WSIB has been uh, issued an order uh, by a court and the, uh, the number of cases of successful judicial review of tribunal decisions uh, could be counted on uh, the fingers of one hand, I believe, still to this day. So the appeals tribunal is independent of the WSIB. Uh, it gets its funding through the Ministry of Labor, sets its own procedures, and it's not uh, a traditional appellate process uh, where, for example, an appeals court receives a, uh, an appeal of a decision, uh, shows a lot of deference to the factual findings of the trial court, looks for uh, uh, errors of law or procedural errors, uh, reaches a natural justice, and then if it finds those and thinks the decision is unsafe, sends it back to the trial level uh, for a new trial or trial de novo. An appeal to the, our appeals tribunal is a trial de novo in every case, so they show no they're not particularly interested uh, in uh, errors in the appeal decision at the board or, or you know, sniffing out legal error. Although, of course, they're very interested in the adjudication process and the facts that uh, led into various decisions that are under appeal to it. It's also meant to be an inquisitorial uh, process rather than uh, an adversarial one, uh, which uh, you know, means the tribunal is not restricted to just hearing the evidence that's brought to it uh, by the different parties to an appeal. And in fact, the vast majority of appeals have only one party appearing, either the worker or the employer who's uh, bringing forward the issue. And with employers, it's usually revenue issues. Uh, it's also not bound by its own precedent, but it is bound by WSIB policy for the most part. So it's a very strange sort of a situation where um, it doesn't show uh, deference to the WSIB's factual findings doesn't have to show them uh, deference on the law, 
for anything not in a policy, uh, but is meant to follow the WSIB policies, uh, which for the most part operate within uh, uh, issues within the board's discretion, uh, as opposed to hard and fast entitlement rules, uh, such as for an occupational disease. Uh, a policy in an occupational disease would usually take the form of uh, X number of years of exposure to these substances um, with the start date at least uh, Y number of years before the date of diagnosis will be um, uh, strong evidence in favor of entitlement. But entitlement could still be allowed in any individual case that did not meet those standards. So it's not uh, it turned out to be much less onerous or uh, much less imposing on the tribunal uh, than was feared when it was first brought in. And, uh, um, and there's also a process for the appeals tribunal to state that WSIB policy is illegal and to enter then into a back and forth process with them. So the tribunal also aims to decide all of the issues uh, that, uh, that can be before it, that have been the subject of final decisions of the WSIB. Uh, and to decide those all at once uh, in one uh, one sitting, one hearing process. Um, so, as mentioned, uh, the tribunal has jurisdiction over most of the final decisions of the board, all the benefit related, uh, uh, important benefit related decisions really, and also decides whether individual lawsuits are barred by the act because the worker is part of the no fault system. Uh, it, in fundamental ways, like a court, and has powers that uh, um, had previously uh, been invested in courts. The members of the panels are uh, ordering council appointments, which means uh, appointed by the cabinet of our provincial government. Uh, and then they sit in one person or three person panels uh, to decide cases, uh, which can be done either in writing or through oral hearings or electronic. Uh, hearings, as has been happening uh, almost exclusively uh, for the last year. Um, they disposed of 3,600 cases in 2019, of which almost 2,700 were final decisions. The others were made inactive or withdrawn. The inactive ones will come back at some point, uh, a lot of them. And, uh, but it's still a large volume of, uh, of cases to pay close attention to, uh, which is uh, what, uh, what the tribunal is meant to do. It's considered to be an expert uh, tribunal within its uh, area of jurisdiction. So it has, again, the strongest level of protection from judicial review. And what would usually happen in judicial review, the sort of standards that would be applied, um, it applies to itself uh, in reconsideration applications and may reconsider its decisions at any time. Again, so legal errors, uh, new evidence not available at the time of the hearing, breaches of natural justice and so forth. So uh, I'm gonna skip over some of this uh, a bit uh, quickly. Within the tribunal, uh, there's obviously an administrative arm that's just sort of doing case management and receiving forms, et cetera. There's a tribunal council office that um, uh, trains legal issues, sometimes does legal submissions uh, on, uh, on, on legal points uh, where that will be of assistance to the tribunal, to the uh, panel, and the medical liaison office, which is a medical subdivision of the TCO. So at the tribunal, uh, the process is more formal, more legalistic uh, than it is at the WSIB. Um, a case record, bound case record, uh, and addenda are compiled, and all of the correspondence that goes back and forth gets compiled into addenda, and uh, cases can often go on for many years, uh, including a post-hearing uh, process um, of, uh, you know, submissions to uh, new evidence, uh, including a, a tribunal medical assessor, which I'll mention in a minute. And, uh, um, and there are other uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, formalities in place that aren't in, in place at the board. So, for example, um, you don't know who the members of the panel will be before you uh, arrive at the hearing on the day. Um, and there's no direct contact with the panel members outside of the hearing, uh, only through the Office of the Vice Chair Registrar or through the Tribunal Council Office, and not even direct contact with the Medical Liaison Office. Um, whereas at the board, uh, 
even during the internal appeals process, uh, you would typically be dealing for pretty much everything but scheduling directly with the appeals resolution officer. So the medical liaison office uh, organizes medical education and uh, um, organizes the entirety of the WSIAT initiated medical assistance, um, which includes uh, putting documents into the um, uh, case record, uh, the medical discussion papers uh, that we're uh, talking about today, and uh, reviews uh, files may make a recommendation about whether or not the tribunal should get its own medical assessor, um, tracks down uh, medical records that are obviously missing. So uh, they have a look and if there's a, a specialist mentioned but no reports from the specialist, they contact the representative and uh, ask them to uh, submit it. So, uh, let's see, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. And uh, so in addition to the tribunal medical discussion papers, which are really, if you have a case involving a shoulder injury, the shoulder injury and disability paper will go into your, um, into your case record, um, even if the question is one of uh, wage loss benefits. And, uh, and it may, may well be relevant uh, since uh, the discussion could shed light on, uh, uh, on issues of what is suitable work for the worker that uh, may or may not be used to reduce the, uh, the level of benefits that they're entitled to. And as noted, they may also identify cases where uh, the panel, uh, uh, they suggest to the panel uh, that they may want uh, to uh, involve a tribunal medical assessor, um, which the medical liaison office then arranges and the panel uh, sets out questions uh, for that assessor uh, to answer. Um, so again, they have uh, a, a sort of a permanent medical uh, council uh, that this is uh, referring to that uh, looks into the uh, uh, the big picture issues. Uh, those doctors only look at uh, very medically complex cases in terms of individual cases and then after the general issues of uh, uh, recruiting the tribunal medical assessors, creating the uh, medical discussion papers, deciding you know when they need to be reviewed, that sort of thing, and uh, working on the internal education uh, uh, processes. The medical assessors um, are uh, authorized by the act and, uh, um, and the tribunal can establish a list. Um, as I've been mentioning all along, it's really only the OIC appoint, appointment panel members uh, who are able to say, we will have a medical assessor on this, uh, on this case and here are the questions we want put to him or her. And then typically that uh, those questions would be sent to an assessor with a um, uh, with a brief of the case materials that are relevant, and uh, often a uh, an interim decision on, uh, for example, in an occupational disease case, the panel may make interim findings about what were the workers' exposures in that workplace, and then send uh, questions about the uh, the relevance and importance of those uh, different factors uh, to a medical assessor. Um, worker uh, needs to consent uh, to that process. Um, and uh, if they don't, it will uh, basically uh, put their case onto inactive uh, status. And then uh, the parties have a right to make submissions on the assessor's report. Uh, so if they disagree with it, uh, to, uh, to make submissions on why they think it, some other evidence should be preferred. So uh, some of the issues um, from the point of view of worker representatives, um, you know, one uh, that I've observed over the years is that uh, the right of parties to make submissions on uh, the materials that are sent to the assessors, uh, the questions uh, that are put to the assessors uh, is unevenly exercised. Uh, some panels are very um, uh, careful to uh, ask representatives uh, to comment on questions before they're sent out. Um, in other cases, the representative would have to insert themselves once they find out that an, an assessor is, uh, is going to be appointed you know, to request the opportunity to review the questions and make submissions on, uh, on uh, how they should be phrased, et cetera. 
Um, there are questions of credentialism, uh, the fit between the credentials and the issues, um, and uh, whether the assessor's knowledge is, is current, and whether they have strong positions on an issue that uh, may not be settled uh, as, a, as a general matter. So someone's a strong uh, partisan uh, on, uh, on a controversial uh, topic uh, where there are large contingents on both sides, uh, they're probably not well, they're definitely not a suitable uh, medical assessor uh, for a case involving that particular issue. And uh, in some of the cases, uh, you can have the feeling that um, uh, that what you're hearing is um, dated knowledge. Um, so I would say, what, six, six seven years ago, um, I had a tribunal medical assessor uh, report in a case that uh, did not cite any uh, any research from the current century, although there had been uh, quite a bit uh, done up to that point. And so uh, there was some question in my mind about whether or not that was uh, that was current, uh, current information and uh, an objection uh, was raised to that. Uh, the matter was sent back to the tribunal medical assessor asking uh, that they address uh, specific uh, papers that had been raised uh, which were again not really addressed, and eventually there was a reconsideration of uh, in favor of uh, my client uh, after an initial denial, uh, all based on you know this approach to the scientific evidence by the assessor uh, and a new assessor appointed. Uh, so the opinions are not binding on the panel members. Uh, these are always legal decisions that are being made, uh, but they're extremely influential. Uh, if, the, uh, if you're on a, a question of initial entitlement uh, and work-relatedness of a, uh, an injury or disease, um, it's, uh, you've got a, a steep hill to climb if the uh, tribunal medical assessor opinion comes back uh, in the negative. So there's also a right of parties to adduce reply evidence um, to the uh, medical assessor as well as make submissions. So, uh, but that is something that really, uh, as a practical matter, does require uh, the representative of the worker of the employer to uh, uh, assert themselves uh, to uh, let it be known that they wish to uh, adduce reply evidence uh, prior to the matter going to Submissions, and again, OCAO can help, can assist with that uh, in reviewing uh, the tribunal medical assessor report, and uh, you know, providing a, an opinion on you know, uh, on the opinion, and on the uh, research being used to back it up, and that is the sort of thing that gets um, prioritized uh, based on the fact that the uh, that the case is right there in front of the panel at that moment. And we encourage people to uh, to bring those forward. Uh, that's really the time uh, to uh, to bring forward evidence that the uh, tribunal medical assessor has missed something. Um, you don't want to be uh, left with a uh, a negative decision and then trying to reopen it on reconsideration uh, immediately afterwards. Uh, if you could have brought forward uh, useful evidence uh, before the decision was made. So the medical discussion papers. Um, these are uh, general reviews of, um, uh, of uh, topics that come up in cases. They're intended for uh, lay people as opposed to medical professionals, um, you know, specifically the panel members. Uh, the, uh, the vice chairs who, uh, who sit at the, uh, at, at the head of a panel um, and the chair um, are typically uh, lawyers. Uh, and then on the three-person panels, there's also a side member representative of workers and a side member representative of employers. Uh, unlike uh, a labor arbitration, uh, where, where sometimes um, it's expected almost that the, uh, the member representing your side will dissent if the case doesn't go your way, uh, there's a, a very healthy um, culture of consensus decision-making at the tribunal. And um, um, I don't know what the stats are on cases where there are dissents, but it is, uh, I would say, certainly less than 1%, um, and uh, um, a fraction of that even, uh, where there is a, a dissent from the, uh, from the main decision. 
Um, so these may deal with a number of topics, basic, setting out uh, the anatomy of a joint, for example, and how it moves and, uh, you know, what's the movement that, uh, um, you know, what's the movement that I call, that's called adduction, what's abduction, that sort of thing. Those are, um, they're all very helpful in that uh, respect. Set issues central to the case, um, such as causation and then perif peripheral issues such as um, diabetes and its relationship, the whole uh, um, issue of disability arising from injuries. And uh, the discussion from which I've pulled those three different topics uh, of these and explanation of uh, everything I've said so far about the, uh, the WSIAT initiated uh, uh, medical uh, procedures is uh, available at this link uh, on the tribunal website. So the medical discussion papers have a uh, uh, have a special place, just as the opinion of the uh, tribunal uh, medical advisor does. Uh, so they're very explicitly not policy, uh, not a tribunal, not representing an official tribunal position on the issues covered in the paper. Um, they're also uh, not binding uh, regarding uh, factual, you know, sub issues that they contain but they're very influential in decision-making. So the, uh, an advocate is wise to uh, take the approach of trying to use them as much as possible, trying to distinguish them where necessary and to refute them only where absolutely necessary. Um, so uh, using, again, very helpful for uh, questions of anatomy or uh, mechanics, uh, or if uh, they support a causal link uh, in your, uh, specific case, you absolutely want to make use of it. Um, if there's a case that where there are statements that uh, could lead the decision maker to take a negative view of your of your issues, uh, you know, the next option is to uh, to distinguish the specific facts of your case from uh, what the paper is saying. So just to be very uh, precise about uh, what that uh, paper says, what the damaging statement really means, um, get into the research that's uh, grounding it. So um, uh, does a more general statement in the, uh, in the paper really reflect a more narrow research study that doesn't have application to your case or your case is uh, atypical in some way uh, that, um, uh, that should make the panel look on it more favorably. Uh, for that, again, you may need further uh, medical research, uh, literature, or a formal report on the specific case. Again, OCAL can provide that and uh, to uh, uh, worker representatives in uh, Ontario cases. Um, and for the refutation, you absolutely uh, need, uh, need backup and uh, uh, further medical literature and uh, uh, should have uh, a written report uh, from a uh, from a medical professional uh, to back you up, rather than just trying to bring forward studies as a as a legal representative. So an example of that would be uh, if there's a rule of thumb that a leg discrepancy of five centimeters or more um, needs to be present before you could say back pain is the result of a limp or uh, a limp in one leg has uh, caused an injury in the opposite leg. Um, then you want to, you know, definitely be bringing uh, uh, more medical evidence to bear to make that case. So some of the issues with the medical discussion papers, uh, they're not peer reviewed. Uh, there's an internal uh, medical liaison office review uh, process, but um, you know, this just uh, in a way, this, uh, this begs the question, most, um, most medical reports on specific causation in the case aren't peer reviewed either. Um, there's, um, you also don't want to have uh, decision makers who are uh, under the impression that uh, peer review is some kind of a magical elixir that you know, renders something 100% valid. There's a good question about what the review process should be uh, in a case like this where uh, there's a, these are really medical legal documents. Um, at this point, most of them are over 10 years old. 
or at least I assessed that uh, a year ago at this time. Uh, and um, um, and were, uh, you know, many of them were uh, dated, obviously, uh, in terms of their references. And, uh, you know, there's good grounds to question then whether or not some of the statements were accurate. Uh, again, you have the question of uh, potential issue partiality where there's ongoing debate and someone has a strong commitment to one side or the other, uh, which um, uh, certainly the, the first author of the of a Duke Putran's contracture paper was a very strong advocate uh, that it uh, could not be work-related uh, other than in the case of uh, traumatic injury um, uh, to a hand. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, I think it was considered to be a much more debatable issue than that uh, in general um, within those who were, uh, who were studying the question. And there are a couple other examples along those lines. Um, and then there's just the general issue that you often run into with all uh, medical evidence and scientific evidence in workers' compensation cases that, uh, of just, you know, is the evidence properly framed to fit in with the legal decision-making process. Uh, so, and there are a number of uh, uh, examples uh, that, uh, that creep up uh, uh, repeatedly um, in all sorts of medical opinions and also in these papers. So, uh, one is um, what I call the horse race uh, approach of just looking at uh, different uh, causal factors always as though they're competing with each other. Uh, and then most specifically to um, uh, even to, to factors that may not be causal in a particular case. So, you know, for any given um, uh, um, problem scenario, what's the actual significance of uh, weight or age, for example? Is age even a causal factor in this particular instance? Or uh, is it just that these things, you know, this particular thing tends to happen at a later age? Uh, does it have any uh, any relevance to the work relatedness? And with weight, um, you know, is it really a competing factor or a coexisting factor that's working together with uh, with something else to cause an injury? And you often see this with the um, um, musculoskeletal injuries, and uh, so to treat um, obesity as a competing cause with uh, the worker, um, uh, you know, carrying, uh, you know thousands of pounds worth of materials back and forth every workday. Um, and, uh, you know, there are some very good uh, tribunal decisions just uh, uh, making the common sense observation that, well, you know, if, if, obese, if the weight of the person's obesity is negatively affecting their knee, uh, then uh, that's just added to by uh, the fact that they're also a, a mason carrying loads of bricks back and forth all day. Uh, and then the same thing with the uh, uh, just the general issue of occupational non-occupational factors, um, and then we have the uh, the Sherlock Holmes approach or the uh, the null compensation hypothesis approach, where um, it's uh, implied in the way that something is uh, set out or a, an issue is framed that uh, it's necessary to uh, refute uh, non-work related uh, causes as having played a role uh, in order to establish entitlement. Um, and that, um, or that it's a condition that's exclusively caused uh, by uh, caused by the uh, the work related um, uh, exposure. Um, I'm not it, sure. Did my uh, did my internet go out? It seems I no like I longer see my slides. Okay. We can hear you, um, but we can't see the slides. That Did you send them to send anyone else who could share? Um, I should be able to share again. Great. Now. I just went on to my uh, my wife's. Uh, okay, everyone. Internet uh, connection. Chat. We we uh, just a few technical difficulties. It'll just be a minute to uh, get another account up, and there we go. Thanks. Okay. So, and then, uh, uh, so to be clear. The legal standard for every issue in one of our workers' compensation uh, cases is the, the civil standard of proof um, a bit modified. So it's what's the balance of the evidence show. It's not scientific or you know, to the point of a medical certainty. That's the decision that has to be made with the benefit of the doubt going to the claimant. So it's, um, 
if the question is um, one of general causation, can diesel exhaust cause uh, bladder cancer, for example? Uh, it's a standard of uh, what is, uh, which one has at least 50% of the, does at least 50% of the evidence support the, uh, the, the positive answer to that? Uh, so that's already a bit of a, uh, uh, turns into a bit of a subject or a question with a lot of subjectivity in it because you have many different types of evidence that are really not uh, commensurable. You can't just add them up into an algorithm or a formula. Uh, if, you, um, if you take the, uh, one of these other approaches, you're really making it much more subjective. So one is the, the grain of sand approach, which is really the sort of, um, you see it a lot in, uh, I think, appropriate and considered um, scientific judgments of saying, well, the studies that have been done so far um, are suggestive. Uh, but uh, more research is required. Um, that can't necessarily be treated as a negative piece of evidence uh, on that issue. If, uh, if all of the studies so far have been pointing in one direction unequivocally, uh, if there's no particular reason to think that you're more likely to have uh, false uh, positives than false negatives, um, if, um, if there's no real ongoing research, uh, which obviously an individual worker can't fund epidemiological studies. All of those things should go into deciding what is the meaning of that uh, by the decision makers, but you will, you know, rarely see the, uh, well, not rarely, but um, you often do not see the information necessary for making those judgments uh, in, uh, in reports or in uh, particular discussion papers. And then there's the issue of the relative risk of 2.0, which is just, uh, um, bothers me too much for me to even get into it. Now, so the medical discussion papers are now uh, very uh, recently divided into two types. And I will uh, try to, um, oops, go back to uh, share something else now. Okay, so now we have current medical discussion papers and archived medical discussion papers. Uh, I'm not sure exactly, uh, uh, this was a question I didn't get a chance to fully research uh, before today. I'm not sure exactly when the decision was made, but it just went up uh, with this formulation on the tribunal's website uh, within the last few weeks uh, when they updated their site. So the current medical discussion papers uh, will continue to be uh, updated. And as always, the parties to an appeal have the opportunity to um, uh, submit further uh, information if they wish, again, in, in terms of just, you know, making use of it or uh, distinguishing it from the facts of their case or attempting to refute one of the points in it. Uh, so again, this paper was recently reviewed uh, in January uh, 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 2020. Um, and appeared uh, sometime between then and uh, this past fall, uh, just as uh, uh, Trevor was actually working on a review on some of the points. So we had to uh, double back on that. But you can see that uh, it, uh, it starts off with the anatomy, the, the, uh, the motion, the different types of imaging, and you know, their relative um, uh, sensitivity. Uh, et cetera, and then uh, gets into the uh, into the different uh, injuries. And uh, as I mentioned, this is one where uh, we have a number of uh, issues that have been raised uh, by uh, uh, workers, stakeholders of uh, of things they would like to have looked into um, to uh, to confirm whether uh, statements are correct, whether they're well founded, what the limitations on them might be, uh, et cetera. So, and on this uh, on this particular list, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome and uh, shoulder injury and disability uh, are currently on our uh, work list. Uh, there's no uh, sort of uh, formal statement of how often they will be uh, reviewed, and some of them are, uh, you know, now uh, uh, quite a few of them are more than five years old, and. Uh, 
you know, we'll, we'll just have to see over time how that develops. Then we have the second category of archived medical discussion papers, uh, which will no longer be reviewed or updated, uh, some of which, you know, just never have been, but these come up less often. Uh, and um, so that's, uh, you know, probably a, a good decision to just sort of formally say, okay, these are in a separate category, but um, every indication is that they will still be placed into the case record uh, in any case where they where they are relevant. Uh, so for this class of cases, it's even more important uh, that representatives be diligent uh, in reviewing the medical discussion papers as they're preparing their case uh, and uh, seeing uh, what areas might present problems uh, and uh, for which they might need a review. So again, we're already uh, looking at uh, a couple of these, uh, the Dupuytren's contracture, uh, limping and back pain and symptoms in the opposite or uninjured leg. And, uh, um, you know, looking forward to uh, Trevor uh, and Naz's uh, presentation on uh, Dupuytren's contracture in just a minute. So I'll just go back to the slides quickly. So again, special, special attention to be paid to the, uh, to the archived reports at this point. So we've had requests from individual worker advocates and also from the OFL's Ontario Federation of Labor's uh, WCB committee, um, named after the WSIB's previous name, Workers' Compensation Board, um, to review several of the medical discussion papers uh, for currency, accuracy, clarity, um, and uh, again, just kind of a good fit to uh, the, the legal decision-making process. Uh, there's the list that I just uh, mentioned. Um, so you can help uh, by raising specific issues uh, that you identify uh, in any of the papers and by bringing those issues to our attention um, rather than just uh, uh, waiting until you know, there are issues uh, around getting it right when doing a general review of one of these papers and then issuing that as a, as a document. We want our, um, uh, our reviews of those uh, papers to be, uh, to be useful, to meet all of the standards of uh, rigorous and uh, uh, independent uh, um, expert evidence uh, for use in a case, and um, uh, that requires a lot of uh, uh, a lot of drafting. If you want something to address every case that will arise with those issues, uh, but if you see it coming up uh, in a case that you have scheduled for two months from now, uh, as a worker rep, uh, you can uh, bring that to us uh, now. And uh, those sorts of issues where someone's, again, where someone's embroiled in a, in a hearing matter uh, at the moment, um, get priority and uh, we would look at it uh, right away and uh, um, provide you with, uh, you know, the opinion may be a phone call to say, well, yeah, it uh, might not be helpful to your case, but uh, they've, uh, they've nailed it. Uh, in the way that they uh, address the issue in the medical discussion paper, or it may be, you know, that we have to ask an ergonomist or a, and or a doctor to uh, produce uh, reports uh, either addressing that issue specifically and or applying it to your case. And uh, we uh, gladly do that and then incorporate the material into our, uh, into our more general work later. Um, and then also to provide feedback as uh, as our uh, reviews of those papers uh, do become publicly available on our website. All of this stuff can be done either by contacting your local clinic directly or uh, sending an email to ask at ocow.on.ca. And that's my presentation. Great, thanks, Dave. Uh, Val, do we have any questions for Dave? Yes, uh, there is one um, that says, does the WISIAT see many cases related to MSD injuries sustained in the workplace, work-related, poor ergonomics related? Um, and if yes, are many successful, that is the decision overturned if denied originally? Um, so I don't have stats right in front of me, but the answer to both questions is yes. 
Um, most uh, most claims are uh, MSD claims um, as opposed to uh, occupational disease claims, and that's uh, the same. Uh, there's probably a higher bit of a higher percentage of uh, disease claims in the tribunal's appeal group, but still the vast majority would be MSD claims, uh, uh, including of the um, initial entitlement variety or secondary issues like the opposite leg or some you know, post-surgery complications, whatever it may be, and, um, uh, and many of them are successful. Great, thanks. Uh, there was another comment where someone commented that uh, that they've experienced claims being overturned where employees are found to have degenerative medical conditions uh, in the past or sports injuries, so that they're, you know, commonly then the disability is attributed uh, um, to non work related factors, I guess. I don't know if you have any comment about that. Um. <sighs> Yeah, I, I mean, just a, a, a bit of a, um, maybe a rehash from a different angle of a, of a point that I raised uh, earlier, which is that, um, you know, it's, uh, it's not at all uncommon uh, to um, uh, find uh, thinking within uh, medical opinions, uh, especially from uh, treating physicians or others who don't usually pay a lot of attention uh, to uh, causal issues. Um, or where it's you know it's not just not an important part of what they're uh, what they're doing uh, to uh, you know just kind of list off a bunch of things uh, that uh, may have played a uh, may have played a role and for this to you know negatively impact things uh, even where it's the even where it is the case that um, a more considered opinion would say well yes but it's all it's all related in causing what's happening right now. And, and the work uh, certainly played a significant role, which again, which is our standard uh, for um, uh, causation or causal efficacy in determining a claim is called the significant contributing factor uh, test, uh, which is uh, sort of borrowed from uh, tort law uh, and the notion of material contribution. And the leading test case from the Supreme Court of Canada or the, the initial um, case uh, from the Supreme Court of Canada discussing uh, what that meant in terms of um, possible apportionment in the, the court law setting, uh, said that uh, a 25% contribution was clearly a material contribution. The same should apply in workers' compensation. So um, those triggers can get pulled too fast on the uh, the other factors, um, unfortunately, even at the tribunal level. So that's a that's a place where the uh, the representative um, and um, uh, has a has a real role to play in ensuring that things get framed properly. And and also a group like OCAL to address medical issues in a way that fits into that framework. Mm 